Welcome to Breakthrough Success. I am your host, Marco Berti, CEO and founder of Content Marketing Plaza, bringing you three new episodes each week where I and top-level guests teach you how to take your business to the next level and achieve your breakthrough. Now, if your business uh, is online and you're looking for that breakthrough, one area you might want to look into is funnels. I help people with their funnels. Uh, In some cases, I actually create the funnel entirely for free. So if that is something you are interested in, uh, definitely contact me at some point. Uh, But another thing you could do uh, to really grow online is to buy other businesses. And that's going to be the focus uh, of this episode because buying businesses, I feel like it's something that uh, is underrated because if you know what to do to grow a business, uh, then you know you just buy businesses that maybe they have hidden potential and you're able to realize that potential. Today's guest, he specializes in that. He is an entrepreneur, investor, and corporate deal maker. He has worked on transactions where if you put them together, worth over $50 billion, uh, and that includes over 250 acquisitions and sales. Uh, and you know he's just done a lot of work with uh, investing. He's done a lot of work in buying businesses. Uh, he has a solid reputation as an investor and corporate deal maker, having worked for uh, companies like Bank of America, Hewlett Packard, Forrester, and Gartner. Uh, he has advised some of the world's largest corporations on investment, acquisitions, disposals, and restructuring. And he has also assisted hundreds of business owners in raising both equity and debt finance. Today's guest. For episode 332 of the Breakthrough Success Podcast is none other than Carl Allen. Carl, it is such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you very much, Mark. Really excited to be here. Carl, I'm happy to have you on the show, and I look forward to talking about buying businesses. This has been a topic we've talked about a little bit on Breakthrough Success, but I like the idea of if you know how to grow it, there's a lot of you know hidden potential with uh, this market. So uh, before we start in that, though, I'm wondering if you could give us a little bit of background on why you started your company, Ninja Acquisitions. Sure. So I'm uh, I'm a pretty old guy these days. I, I'm nearly 50. I started my deal making career way back in 1992. I went to work on Wall Street. So I did the hard yards doing mergers and acquisitions in the investment banking world. And then went to business school, worked a little bit in private equity. And then my last kind of corporate job I was working for Hewlett Packard, so I was buying and selling, you know, billion-dollar businesses for uh, for HP. And my my last deal with them, I, I was in a boardroom in Moscow in 2008, and my wife called me, uh, who was living in the UK at the time, and she said, I don't know how to say this, but um, she was 36 weeks pregnant, and she went into labour, so I had to get myself back from Moscow to the UK, and I literally. Uh, I walked into the hospital five minutes before my son was born. So that was a big kind of thing for me. I was done working for other people and being a corporate slave and flying all over the world and not being with my family. So I quit um, and I started, uh, I was a business broker for a short space of time. And then I thought rather than buying and selling businesses for other people, I'm going to do it for myself. So I started buying and selling small businesses online, offline. Um, and I still do that today on 17 different businesses in loads of different markets, online, offline, professional services, engineering, media, PR, you name it. And then about three years ago, uh, I started coaching and mentoring entrepreneurs to kind of follow my methods because uh, there's so many businesses in the world for sale today. There's over two million just in North America and only about one in 13 of them will sell in any 12 month period because entrepreneurs typically, whether it's their first acquisition or whether they own a business and they want to do a bolt on acquisition, and we'll get into that later, uh, people don't know A, how to do deals like this, and B, how to raise the financing so that in a lot of cases, they don't have to invest their own money to be able to acquire that business for themselves. So I, I kind of really passionate about, you know, sharing my knowledge and my skills. And as of today, I have about 2000 entrepreneurs in my network. Some of them I'm partnering with, some of them I'm investing in their deals, but generally I'm just coaching and mentoring them to follow a proprietary system that I've developed over what is now 26 years. Mm-hmm. 
And it's really interesting you mentioned all these different businesses you have. And I knew you had a bunch of different businesses because of just the initial conversations we had. But um, I'm also really interested. I mean, you mentioned a bunch of different niches. I mean, I, I just remember engineering was one of the uh, niches that you mentioned. So um, I, I want to get into, you know, how you manage all of this. But I also want to ask you, like, I mean, with all these different areas these businesses cover, um, how what's the rationale for buying a business in an area you don't necessarily know, unless you know engineering and uh, I could be, yeah. like, I'm wondering uh, what that thought process is. Yeah. So my, my general advice to anybody that's looking to acquire a business for the first time is go and buy something in a sector that you know and that you understand and you're really passionate about because buying a business is actually a lot easier than owning a business. So there's no point buying a business in somewhere you don't know. If you've spent you know your time online so let's say let's say you work for a facebook ad agency or your or you're a website designer you wouldn't go and buy a restaurant or, or a chemical processing business you know you'd go and buy an it company because you know that space you've got sector expertise you've got a network that you can plug in to help you add value and grow that business so if uh, if you're a first time buyer then buy something in a space that you know if you own a business at the moment, then you really want to be buying businesses that have some strategic fit with what you're already doing. So, for example, if you own a software company, then go and buy an IT services company. And then you can sell the software to the IT services customers and vice versa. And as you bring those companies together, there's a load of kind of duplicate costs you can you can take out. So it's a one plus one equals three on the revenue side. And it's a one plus one equals five on the cash flow side. And that's a really good way of, of scaling a business. So let's say you've got an online business. Let's, let's say you've got an Amazon drop ship business and you're doing a million dollars a year in, in gross revenues. And it's taken you five years to build it. it. Might take you another three to get it to two million. But if you go and buy another million dollar Amazon business, you can double your business in like 60 days and you can use other people's money to finance that transaction. So mergers and acquisitions, it's the rocket fuel for growth for big businesses, but it's exactly the same process for a one million dollar business as it is for a one you know, billion dollar business. You know, look at Microsoft and Cisco and even Apple. You know, did, did Apple decide to go out and design new headphones for its customers because that's what they wanted no they went and bought beats or you know amazon uh did they decide to create their own app for listening to audiobooks no they went and bought audible you know m a is the fuel for large companies to grow it should exactly be the same thing for small businesses and i really like how you break that down how like big companies are doing it and how we could do it in like a smaller way now, I know that for some people, you know, like a million dollars to put into a uh, Amazon dropshipping business, that's a lot of money. But, you know, there's probably a lot of others out there where maybe there are a thousand dollars or a few hundred. I mean, uh, there are a lot of businesses that are not that expensive. It's not like you have to be a super big company to do it. I'm wondering, though, how do we find these businesses that work for us, especially from like a personal brand standpoint, uh, where it could just be you sharing your thoughts as like a thought influencer or something like that? Yeah. So, you know, if you if you like owned a podcast and, you know, you wanted to go out and buy, you know, a business that sold products and services through like a marketing funnel and it, and it was aligned in some way to your brand and what you were doing, then there's tons of different ways to go and find businesses. So the most common ways of, of finding deals and you, you need to look at a lot of deals, really, and then and then kind of vet them quickly and filter them, because not every business that you look at you know, is really going to kind of resonate with you. So, you know, you look at a whole bunch of deals and you can go to broker websites like Empire Flippers or bizbysell.com. But the best deals you get are really kind of through leveraging your network. So, you know, people are in online, they're in all these kind of Facebook groups. You know, I, I was looking for an online business and, you know, I, I, I'm in the ClickFunnels. I use ClickFunnels in all of my businesses and I, I'm in the ClickFunnels Facebook group. And I just put a post in there saying, hey, I'm looking to buy a certain type of business and overnight you know I had like 63 leads and you know it took me a couple of hours to kind of filter them down and then the one I liked the best I acquired it so and what's great about buying businesses once you found one you really like it's really easy to kind of finance it so in the United States the real rocket fuel 
for small business acquisitions is something called an SBA 7A loan. So what's what's happened in the United States over the last 10 years is there's an epidemic of, of incredible proportions because you've, million, you've got millions of businesses for sale and there's not enough buyers with access to capital or knowledge to be able to do these deals. So the federal government, uh, I think it was back, it was right, I think it was right at the end of the George Bush administration, just before Obama came in, they they created this SBA 7A loan program um, where they will lend you up to 90% of the purchase price of a business. So let's say you found an online business that's got no assets. So normally when you're buying a business, you're borrowing against the, the assets of the business, like the receivables and the real estate and kind of fixed assets. That's what you do if you buy an engineering company. But online businesses or software as a services type businesses or you know podcast businesses, they've got revenues and cash flow, but they don't have any physical assets. So what the SBA did is they created this 7A loan program and they'll lend you up to 90% of the purchase price. So if you found a business that was worth, say, a million dollars, the SBA would kick in $900,000 of the money. And then the other 10%, you either get the seller to kind of carry that as like a future payment, which is called a seller finance note, or uh, you go and you you know, you know put fifty dollars or $100,000 of the money in yourself, or you can use the cash that's already in the business. Or if you don't have any money, but you've got passion and expertise in that sector, you go and sell a little piece of the deal to like an angel investor, who'll put the deposit money in to allow you to buy the business. So it's really kind of rocket fuel for you to go out and, uh, and and do these deals. But still, even though the SBA's, you know, very, very well founded now, uh, you know, they're struggling for deal flow. They've got all this money to lend on deals. There's just not enough entrepreneurs that have got the knowledge and the, you know, and the expertise to go out and do these deals. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, I, I created my uh, my mentoring program was was to really empower entrepreneurs with the mindset and the tools and the skills to be able to find these deals, negotiate winning deal structures, and then get the deals financed and get them over the line. Yeah, I really like uh, that idea of, uh, I mean, a million dollar business. I mean, people think, wow, I got to put down a million dollars. But I mean, if you the way you broke it down, I mean, just a hundred thousand, maybe even split that in half, maybe even set up a payment plan to just get that hundred thousand out eventually. And I know what some people are thinking. When you do something like that, you know, there's nine hundred thousand that you still owe. But if you grow the business, then the cash flow can take care of all those payments, especially if you know how to grow the business. Absolutely. And what's interesting, this doesn't happen so much online. Uh, It does in some cases, but in the offline space, if you're looking to buy a brick and mortar business, in a lot of cases, you can do those deals without having to put any of your money in. Because, you know, if you look at there's 10,000 baby boomers retiring every single day in the United States. And according to the Wall Street Journal, 19 percent of them own small businesses and they just can't sell them. That the, the number one method of a business owner exiting their business is to shut it down and turn off the lights uh, because they, you know, they're tired, frustrated that, you know, they want to retire and there's nobody there to, to buy the business. So they'll give you the business for free. You just pay them. You know, you'll just profit share with them over, say, a couple of years. And what's great for the seller is they can retire. They can stay in bed or go play golf. And they're still getting some cash flow. Uh, they're getting the cash flow they were getting when they owned the business, but they don't have to go in and, and, and work for it. And, and a lot of entrepreneurs as well, they get so burnt out. You know, they start a business, which for me, starting a company is crazy um, because the failure rate is just so high. Uh, my advice is always to go and buy a business in a sector you love rather than, you know, start one up. Because when you start a business, You've got no capital, no credit, no employees, no customers, no products and services, no premises. And when you buy an existing business, you've got all of that stuff. So you can do new cool things and innovate, but you've still got all that cash flow to tie you over. And you've got employees that will help you build whatever you want to build. And then once you've built it, you've got a customer base there that's probably going to want to buy it. So, um, you know, I, I, I strongly advise against starting 
you know, starting businesses. And, you know, I have a really cool analogy, Mark, for that. And it's about Tesla. So, you know, I, I spend about half of my time in the UK and Tesla has just come to the United Kingdom. So I've literally just bought a Tesla in the last few weeks. And, you know, did I did I go and buy the wheels and the battery and, and the console and the steering wheel and the seats? Did I go and buy all those pieces and then put them on my driveway and then figure out, you know, how do I assemble all that and make it work? Or did I go to a Tesla dealership, buy a Tesla that's already been built and then basically finance it, no money down through Tesla? That's what I did. Uh, and I got the same result much quicker, cheaper and safer than if I tried to build that car myself. And it's kind of a weird analogy, but that's exactly the same message when you're wanting to be an entrepreneur. You know, if you're stuck in a corporate job and, and you, you want your own business, people think it's so cool and sexy to go and create right. a startup, but it's the riskiest, most dangerous thing you can ever do. So go and buy a business that somebody else has built, doesn't want anymore, and then use other people's money to buy it. Yeah, I really like that analogy a lot because there are certain things that we just know, like, you know, we wouldn't do these on our own, but uh, when it comes to business, it's something different. Now, it is fun to start a business, but I feel like you could get that same passion if you do buy a business. I've never bought a business yet, but it is something that I'm definitely uh, looking into. Uh, one of the questions that I did hint at earlier is that, I mean, you mentioned all these different businesses uh, that you have. So how are you able to manage all these different businesses? I mean, it's not like you just buy something in like the stock market and then it's just passive. Like there's yeah. some work you have to do, at least in the beginning. Yeah, so that's a great question. So I am so I'm an owner investor, not an owner operator. So a lot of the people that are in my program, they will go and buy a business. Uh, they'll buy one company and then they want to go into that company and be the general manager. So I don't do that because I'm I'm pretty much sector agnostic. So I, I will buy businesses in uh, in all sectors if I believe that, you know, we can grow those businesses. So what I always do is two things. So when I'm looking for deals, I always look for businesses that have got, you know, either a good management team that's already in that business or there's somebody that can step up to the plate and be like my internal general manager in that business. And for that, I'll give them up to 25% of the equity in the business to really empower them as my new partner to do the daily operational work. And then what I do is I have a fairly unique uh, operating system that I deploy that's around scorecards and metrics. And what I do with all of my general managers is I limit them all to 30 minutes a week of time with me. It's a very, very structured meeting where we go through the results, we go through any issues that they've had, and we solve them and we move on to the following week. And there's a whole set of, of online dashboards that I can look at. So if I'm in my pajamas, drinking my coffee in the mornings, I can log in and I can see what all the numbers are. And some businesses, I don't even check in you know, once a quarter, you know, they're doing like so well. Other businesses, like especially with new deals, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm checking on them kind of weekly. And what I always do when I acquire a business is I'll spend a week in the business at the start, you know, changing the culture, getting to know the employees, putting the systems in place, and then I can walk away knowing that the business is, is being taken care of. Mm -hmm. And that's a really good approach where uh, you look for businesses that are able to do that on their own or you have someone in there because, uh, I mean, to manage all these different businesses, it's really hard to sustain that over a long period of time. I mean, uh, if you're talking about like dozens of businesses and like, you know, how much time do you really have in the day? Uh, it's very limited. And then you've got uh, a lot of other things you want to do other than the business work. So uh, it's definitely good to have those kinds of systems in place to manage them. One question that I do have, um, we've talked a little bit about, you know, how to buy a business, uh, that whole process. But uh, let's dive a little into mindset here. So I wonder if you yep. could share with us, what do you believe holds most people back from uh, taking that step and buying the business? So it's a number of things. I would say it's fear, uh, working outside of our comfort zone. I think as human beings, you know, our two million year old brain is used to, you know, doing what it knows and, and, and staying in its own lane. I think as humans, you know, we're often reluctant to 
jump outside of our comfort zone. And, you know, my attitude to life is, you know, feel the fear and, and, and do it anyway. I'm not talking about jumping off bridges or swimming with sharks, but uh, going out there and buying a business. It, it's a people to people transaction. So there's no excuse for anybody that's got passion and, and a modicum of business knowledge to go out there and uh, and want to try it. And then the, the other kind of issue that I think most people have, and you can apply this to anything in life, is a lot of people are walking around with what I call limiting beliefs. So they're telling themselves stories in their mind that they can't do something and this is too hard and this is never going to work. And what's really interesting about the brain is you've got you've got the conscious mind at the kind of very front, which can only store a little bit of information. And then you've got this big subconscious mind, which is most of your brain. And half of it is your um, your, your, your kind of history and your memory. And the other half is kind of like your imagination. And if you tell yourself something enough times through incantations, if they're positive or through doubting self-talk and limiting beliefs, if they're negative, then your, your subconscious brain gets confused and it thinks they're real and, and it drives you away from the results you're actually looking for. Whereas if, if you set yourself up every day in a really positive frame of mind and a positive state and, and you're focusing on what you want, and your goals and your dreams, then eventually your brain hacks itself and thinks they're real and empowers you forward, you know, to do those things. So fear and limiting beliefs for me are are, are the two biggest things. And, you know, a lot of the business owners that I come across, you know, they're just they're so hardwired with that. And, you know, th those kind of techniques, those those skills, you can apply to anything, you know, people that want to quit smoking and, you know, people that you know, want to do whatever they want to do. It all comes down to your purpose. You know, if you've, you know, if you look at anything as, as the what, the why, and the how, if your what is a clearly defined outcome, it's a real clear goal that you want to achieve. That's great. But the real power, the real juice is your why, your purpose. If you want something badly enough in your life, you'll find a way. Obviously, you can hire mentors, you can take courses, you can read books to kind of teach you some of those strategies. But if you wanted something so badly, you'd find a way. If, you know, Mark, if I kidnapped your family and held them at gunpoint and said, you know, you've got 30 days to buy a business without spending your own money, mm. yeah, you'll make it work. Yeah, Trust me, yeah. <laughs> would make it work. So with, with a lot of the people that I work with, they've got real kind of defined purpose because, you know, they're either stuck in a job that they hate, they want freedom, work-life balance, you know, they want the pride of ownership of a small business. And that really lights them up and really empowers them to take the action every day, you know, to make this work. Um, I work with small business owners that, you know, are stuck at, stuck at a million, two million dollars in revenue. They want to grow and they're just so sick and tired of trying to scale and spending money on ads where they can go and buy another business of the same size, even larger build them together and double and triple the size of their businesses, you know, really, really quickly. They get more cash flow. They get more people. You know, they get more revenues and they're able to take more time off and spend less time in their businesses and be with their family. And that that passion, that fuel, you know, is what makes them drive and take the action that, that they need to do. So we all do things in life for a reason. Uh, it's just having the right reasons and empowering that. But the eye of the tiger, as I call it, uh, I don't know. Did you ever did you ever watch the Rocky movies? Yes. Yeah. So Ro Rocky three, great movie. It's a great analogy. So in Rocky three, Rocky's the world heavyweight champion and he's up there and he's kind of like going through the motions. He's he's lost the passion to keep going. And he fights Clubber Lang. who was the guy that was in the A team. And Clubber Lang literally batters him in like two rounds and Rocky loses the title because he didn't have the eye of the tiger. And then his trainer dies and he gets this real fuel and purpose and desire to get back and be the heavyweight champion of the world. And, and he trains and he goes back in the ring and he, he leathers this, this Apollo, not Apollo Creed, the Club of Lang. He, he beats him up and he wins the title back because he had the eye of the tiger. He had that, that fight and passion to want to do it. So really, really important. It's probably the most important thing in life for me, not just in business, in life. Have a purpose for what you want to do. Yeah, those are really uh, great insights, Carl. I mean, it's really uh, essential to uh, think about 
what it is that we need to do, like having that purpose and also paying attention to those thoughts inside our heads because they could really be uh, hurting our potential because the subconscious, that is a very real. Uh, I mean, you may not think about it right away, but that subconscious really plays out like when you're sleeping, when you're just doing, uh, it plays out in your entire life. So it's really good to uh, think about what's going on in your mind and uh, uh put positive thoughts in there and find a way to get the things done that you want to get done. And we talked about fear. We talked about uh, some of that stuff going on in our head. But I wonder if you could also share with us some of your habits that you have developed that you would consider essential for your success. Yeah. So so for me, it starts the minute I open my eyes in the morning. So my goal in the morning is to get myself into a really high peak state to give me that fuel and passion, you know, to get through my day. My days are long. My days, you know, are sometimes quite arduous. I travel a lot. Um, so being in a, in a phenomenal peak state early in the morning is really key for me. So I go through a simple process uh, every single morning. So the first thing I do when I wake up is, is I meditate. It clears my mind. It sets me up, you know, for the day. I meditate for like 10 minutes. Then I have some kind of affirmations that I kind of go through about who I am and, and, and what I believe. And that's kind of just reinforcing again all those positive things that are burning themselves into my subconscious mind. And then I do a lot of visualization. So I'm visualizing my goals, what I want to achieve today, what I want to achieve this year, what I want to achieve in my life. Uh, and then I exercise. Uh, it's great when you get the blood flowing early in the morning, you know, it raises your metabolism. Uh, gets you in a really kind of positive state and then um, I, and then I, I do gratitude so uh, I then you know give thanks for all the great things I have in my life you know my family and, I, and I'm not talking about material things like houses and cars and money I'm talking about my family you know I'm talking about my employees I'm talking about my businesses I'm talking about my health you know, I'm talking about my spiritual beliefs. Um, and what's really funny is when you're grateful and you and you give gratitude, it's biologically impossible for you to feel sad when you're grateful, even for small things like, you know, my um, my French bulldog, Ralph, who comes and snuggles me in the morning when I when I'm going through my, my gratitudes, uh, you know, just his love being with me in the morning. Um, you know, it, when, when you feel grateful for something like that, it, it's biologically impossible to feel down. So and then what I do is I journal. So I, I journal how I'm feeling, the results that I'm getting. You know, what are my magic moments? What things can I be really grateful for from yesterday or the day before? And then I kind of keep that. And then at the end of the month, you know, I, I kind of go through and I, uh, I, I review all those. So I do all that. It takes me like an hour, hour and 15 minutes, depending on how hard I work in the gym. Uh, and it sets me up for like having an incredible day, like every single day. I even do it on weekends. I even do it when I'm on vacation. You know, my wife and I, we, we, we cruise a lot and we have a couple of vacation homes. And when we're in those places, every single day, 6 a.m., I'm up, I'm at it. I'm, I'm, I'm doing my meditation. I'm doing my routine. And then I'm just in a great place for the rest of the day. So, um, you know, I, I, I would never... Uh, I'd never, ever, ever not do that. It's so important to me. And it's really interesting you mentioned the gratitude because I feel like that is something we should all be doing. I really like that. I never knew it was biologically impossible uh, to be sad while expressing gratitude, but I have known about gratitude's importance and uh, really puts things into perspective, something I definitely recommend everyone does. And one thing I also recommend everyone do is really practice their uh, self-development, their education on specific topics, like you're listening to this episode right now. I also like to read books uh, to build up on that. So I'm wondering, Carl, if you could share with us one book that you believe would have a positive impact on us. Wow, what a great question. So I'm kind of, I'm from the... Um... I'm from the Warren Buffett school of, of kind of reading. Um, you know, I, I read about three hours a day. Wow. So I'm always constantly reading. And uh, I spent a lot of time with uh, with Ty Lopez over in uh, in Beverly Hills, who you might know. So Ty's a massive reader, and he kind of got me through into the whole kind of reading stuff. Um, one of the things that about me is is I never read novels. 
Um, I know whenever I'm traveling with my family, they're always reading novels, you know, Jack Reacher novels or John Grisham novels. I don't. I'll only ever read books where I can learn something. So I'm reading books about marketing. I read a lot of books about practical psychology and about sales. But my favorite books are uh, books about successful business people. So Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, um, you know, Phil Knight, you know, because what I found in life is success leaves clues. So as human beings, we, we need to model successful people. And if you want to achieve something in your life and you don't know how to do it, go and model somebody that's done that and achieved the results that you want. My favorite book of the last, well, two, two books I, I'm going to recommend that I've read uh, in the last kind of few weeks that I absolutely love. So uh, there's a book called Shoe Dog. Um, I don't have a copy. Of my, my library is like on the other side of the office. So Shoe Dog is the autobiography of Phil Knight, who um, is still, I believe, the chairman of Nike. And it talks about how he founded Nike in the early days and created the kind of waffle sole. Um, really funny story. He, uh, he he was trying to design a running shoe because he was an avid runner up in Oregon back in the 60s. And uh, he was in his kitchen, like trying to figure out the design to create a new running shoe. And at the same time, he was making waffles in one of those waffle machines. <laughs> and it was at that time making his breakfast, he realized that a running shoe and a sole could be made out of like a waffle machine and he used to use his own machine waffle machines wow. to make these souls and that book's a great book about resilience and persistence the things he went through in those early days to keep that business going was incredible so i really really love that book and then my favorite book about mindset and, and again all about peak performance is a great book from a guy called david goggins called can't hurt me and David Goggins was a Navy SEAL. And we know that the Navy SEAL guys, when they go through the BUDS training, they're some of the hardest people on the planet. You gotta have a mindset off the charts to go through that type of stuff. And then not only did he do that, he went through all the elite training programs of all the other special forces, like the Delta Force and all that stuff. He even went through the SAS program in the UK. And then he became an ultra marathon runner, running like 300 kilometers in 36 hours and he tells you a lot about mindset and 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 you know how to get yourself in that super peak state so th those are two of my favorite books that i've read in the past few weeks and you know because i read two books a week three books a week sometimes yeah we could talk for days you know on the books i have thousands and thousands and thousands of books um about business and marketing and mindset and psychology you know i'm, I'm an avid avid reader Carl, thank you for sharing those great book recommendations. Those will all be in the show notes, marketbreak.com slash E332. Uh, we'll also throw in content marketing secrets in there for anyone who's interested in that. Uh, but before we wrap up this episode, Carl, I've asked you several questions throughout our time together, but what do you believe is one question that we need to be asking ourselves more often? So the one question I think we need to be asking ourselves every single day is two things number one am i doing in my life what i truly truly want to do and have i got that real purpose and that real desire to take it forward and you know i remember a great um it, this was a great keynote presentation you can watch it on youtube steve jobs's address i think to stanford university many many years ago before he died and you know he said this you know you've only got one life do something you love, do something you'll enjoy, because if you do that, you'll have the guts and the passion and the drive and the determination to see it through when times get hard. You know, so many businesses fail, so many startups fail inside of the first five years, even one year. And I, and I believe it's because people are going into life and they're doing things that are not really kind of lighting them up. So when times get tough and life's tough everywhere you look, you know, life hits you really hard. If you've got that desire and that passion and you're doing what you truly love, you'll power through that easily, like wading through water. You know, if you're not doing something that really lights you up and is going to add value to your life and really serve you, then 
even minor challenges will, will, will feel very, very difficult. So asking yourself that question every day and then also asking yourselves, you know, how can I be my absolute best? How can I serve my family? How can I serve my community? How can I serve myself? You know, how can I be the very best person that, that I can be? You know, God's put me on this earth to be outstanding and do outstanding things and get outstanding results. You know, you've only got one life, you know, make it count. Carl, that is a powerful message for us to cap this episode. I appreciate you coming on, sharing all of your great insights. I know Carl has a free webinar training, How to Buy Your First Business Cash Free, which is a little bit of what we were talking about. He goes more into detail in that free webinar. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, the link to that, which will be in the show notes, is ninjaacquisitions.com slash free. Perfect. Well, once again, Carl, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show and sharing all of your great insights. Thank you for being on Breakthrough Success. My pleasure, Mark. Really enjoyed it. Thank you very much indeed.